start off with, I'd like to ask um, for a bit of audience participation. Could you please stick your hand up if you've ever created a data set? Ooh, ooh, okay, that's good, that's good. All right, could you please stick your hand up if you have ever created anything that you're really proud of that didn't exist before you created it? So that could be like a garden or, um, I don't know, a knitted jumper or a meal or something. If you've ever created something you're really proud of. Child, child works. Okay, all right, there's more people, that's good. That's good, I'm glad that there's more people who have, have created something they're proud of. Um, of those people, of all of you who have created something that you're proud of, how many of you feel that you've got um, recognition for that creation? Mm, yeah, anyway. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> Just uh, <laughs> make sure people are awake. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, data publication specifically. Now, one of the um, downsides of presenting l so late on during the programme is the fact that an awful lot of what I'm going to be saying has already been covered by um, other people in over the past day, day and a half. But that's good because that means that I can skip over the, the bits that I need to explain um, because you've heard it all already and I can concentrate on the, the more advanced, interesting bits. Uh, as uh, Najla said, I work for the British Atmospheric Data Centre. It's one of the um, Federation of Data Centres uh, funded by the UK's Natural Environment Research Council and we cover all sorts of uh, environmental data from ecology, hydrology, atmospheric science, polar data, Earth's observation, oceanographic data um, and all sorts of stuff. So there's, there's an awful lot of stuff we deal with. So I'm going to start off what, again, preaching to the choir here, why do we want to link data and publications? Well, when it comes down to it, the whole process of doing science is about reproducibility and testing our assertions, and if we don't have the data, we can't do that. The internet is brilliant. It can do all sorts of really cool things, like provide pictures of cats, um, but it also allows us to link things to other things quickly and easily. Now, this is a bit of a two-edged sword, because when you're talking science, you want to have this object of record, this um, fixed thing which is permanent that you can identify and use as the basis of your analyses or draw your conclusions from. So when it comes to applying that to data, we still have quite serious problems with think issues like data persistence, data and metadata quality, and of course attribution and credit for the data producers. And uh, as I said, if you've ever created something you're proud of, you know what a data producer feels like. So, historically speaking, data, you know, journals have always published data. Uh, it's just back in the days, well, we've got the example there. No, it's not doing anything. Never mind. So, there we've got uh, a picture, Robert Hooke, 1665, drawing cells. And then, from the scientific papers of William Parsons, 3rd Earl of Ross in 1800, that is measurements of stars in the spiral nebula. So, that is data. And it's in a hard, co or hard copy dead tree format. Actually, these aren't, because I stole them off Google. But um, never mind that. But now we're in the situation that we're generating so much data that we just can't afford to print it out on dead trees and bind it up as books. It just doesn't work. A lot of people are creating data. We're only going to get more of it. We've got to, there's lots of talk about floods and the data deluge and stuff. We've got to think of ways that we can start coping with this. We either sink or swim. So I think it's about time we started building some boats. So let's not reinvent the wheel here. We already have a working method, a strong historical precedent for linking between publications, between one thing and another. And it's commonly used, commonly understood by the research community. It's already used to create metrics to show how much of an impact something has and it can up be applied to digital objects. So, we've got this system, it works, people use it. Let's take that and build on that and extend citation to other things like data and code and multimedia. And the best bit is it's just tweaking slightly researchers' perceptions. They don't have to learn an entirely new way of doing things, it's just extending what they already do. So I won't go into the reasons for citing and publishing data, we've been through these before. Let's just take it as read that citing and publishing data is a good thing for as many people as you can possibly think of. Um, 
From a strictly data center specific point of view, we want to people to cite and publish data because if they cite and publish data, that means that there's more incentive for the researchers who produce the data sets to share their data in, um, in trusted repositories with appropriate formats and with full metadata. And that's really important for us and which is why we're involved. So uh, my affiliation in the program is given as BADC Prepared. And Prepared is the um, project that I'm managing at the moment. It stands for Peer Review for Publication and Accreditation of Research Data in the Earth Sciences. And yes, it's a twisted acronym, but let's not worry about that too much. So we're about seven months into the project. Uh, we have a range of partners. We're led by the University of Leicester and Jonathan Teds. And um, in our range of partners, we have um, librarians, California Digital Library. We have uh, academic publishers, Wiley Blackwell and Faculty of the Thousand. We have data centers, the BADC and the US National Center for Atmospheric Research. And of course, we have the Digital Curation Center who are providing support and a general kind of overview. And we're not just looking at the earth sciences. The earth sciences are, is our primary focus, but Faculty of the Thousand deals with um, life and biomedical science research. So we're keeping an eye on that. So we've only got 12 months to do this project. We haven't got an awful lot of money, so we're trying to do the best we can with what we've got. We're looking at um, very pragmatic ways. One of the main reasons that sparked off this project um, and it's a really good opportunity that we've got here. Um, Wiley Blackwell launched Geoscience Data Journal uh, last April. And Geoscience Data Journal is a data journal uh, in collaboration with the Royal Meteorological Society. And it's an open access journal and it publishes short data articles which are linked and to and cite data sets that have been deposited in approved data centers and given a DOI or other permanent identifier. So, What's a data article? Brian's mentioned this before. It, it's a paper or a couple of pages or some information about a data set giving details of its collection, processing, software, files <laughs> format, etc. And what it's not, or it, the paper describes, the data article describes the when, how, and why the data was, was collected and what the data product is. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't go into the analysis on the data set and doesn't require any novel conclusions to be drawn. Because I know from my own experience that when you spend months of your life collecting data and making sure that it's fit for publication, you just don't have the time to start running cumulative distribution functions over it or applying the latest statistical technique. Often it's easier to just pass that on to somebody who does the analysis. So traditional uh, journal model, you have your author, they write a paper, they submit it to the journal, um, the reviewer over here reads the paper, provides comments, whatever. Question is, where's the data in all of this? It's, I don't know, somewhere off in the corner or hidden, hidden on a CD in a desk drawer somewhere. Not ideal. So a data journal, the author writes the data paper and they submit the data paper to the uh, journal. And at the same time, or hopefully just before they submit the data paper to the journal, they submit the data set to a repository. And the data journal, the data article itself, has a link within it to the data set in the trusted repository. And then the reviewer can re review the article and also can look at the data set itself and review the data set as well. So here is a data paper mock-up. It's not a real thing yet because GDJ doesn't actually have any published uh, data papers yet, although we are so close. <laughs> I've been told within a week. Anyway, the important thing to note in this mock-up is that the data citation is right up the top of the, the, um, the paper. So um, underneath the title and author name and all the rest of it, the first thing you see before even the abstract is the citation for the data set. And you also get the citation for the data set in the reference list, which allows it to be picked up by those automatic systems that do citation counts. So Prepared is looking at a number of topics. Well, three main ones. Uh, so we're looking at workflows and cross-linking between the journal and repository. We're looking at repository accreditation. How do you know you can trust a data center? And scientific peer review of data. And I'm going to mainly talk about workflows and cross-linking because that fits in with nicely with this interoperability work. <coughs> uh, I'm happy to talk about other topics if you'd like some other time. So to start off with, we went and uh, went and captured all our data repository workflows. And we discovered very quickly that the data center and journal workflows 
are very varied. We don't have a one-size-fits-all method. Even within the BADC, we have multiple workflows depending on whether we've got the same, um, whether what level of interactions we have with the data sources, whether we have an engaged submitter who's willing to answer questions about the data set and just provide extra metadata, or whether we have um, somebody who just says, here, take my data set, no, I don't want to answer any questions about it ever again. So there's lots of differences. So that, I expect you're not able to read that workflow down the bottom, don't worry about it. It's just to give you an indication of how much is actually involved. Similarly, we've got, this is the uh, workflow for um, NCAR. And there are similarities, but there are also an awful lot of differences. And I suspect that if you went and looked at the workflows from any data repository you could mention, it's gonna be really, really hard to kind of standardize. Uh, if you want these slides, I'm happy to make them available after the fact. So here we go, journal workflow. Again, there are certain threads that are common through various journal workflows, but there's, there's always wrinkles, there's always idiosyncrasies. So we're still working on um, the comparisons of the workflows and the identifications of the, the sweet spots, the best places to um, put the cross links between the, um, the journal workflows and the repository workflows. And the aim is to minimize the effort needed to submit a data paper by taking advantage of already submitted metadata. If you think about it, if you're a researcher, you've already filled out this huge long form for metadata when you deposit your data in a, in a repository. You don't want to have to do exactly the same thing all over again simply to submit it to a data journal. Uh, and also, if you have to do it twice, there's more chance that you'll get typos and other errors creeping in. So, cross-linking. This is what we have to do for prepared. Like I said, we have to be pragmatic. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of money. We have to demonstrate cross-linking between Geoscience Data Journal and BADC. Great, we can do that. That's easy. The problem is, this, as soon as you start adding in other uh, data centers to the mix and other data journals to the mix, you have a plethora, a vast, major, or a vast wodge of links all of which are potentially ever so slightly subtly different. And this direct cross-link isn't scalable. We need to have off-the-shelf solutions that can work across multiple research domains. So the ideal situation is if we have a registry in the middle where the data centers can uh, link with the registry and the data journals can also kind of link with the data centers through it. And the registry could provide other functions as well as being an intermediary. So they could do um, data center um, certification, certify that data centers are trustworthy. They could administer linking mechanisms. They could provide search and metrics functions. Now, the disadvantage is, if you have a single registry, you've got a single point of failure, and also it's really hard to standardize across different research domains. And this last point I added after um, seeing all the presentations yesterday, and I'm thinking, I need to talk a bit more with people, but could open air be this registry? And if it could, brilliant. So, question is, do we have a start here already? Um, so, DataSite, uh, Herbert already mentioned this, they have a standard, um, and somebody else did yesterday who have forgotten, but they have a standardized set of bibliometric metadata that has to be submitted before a DOI for a data set can be minted by a repository. And this, um, so we've got this standardized metadata up here. That gets deposited in the data site metadata store, which is made openly accessible. Given a DOI, a journal can then easily find the DOI, um, the, the data site metadata. Data site also have the content resolver. So the journal can pull the DOI specific metadata from the data site meta store, metadata store and into the article. That's easy. What we don't have is the return link where the journal can let the repository know that the data set has been cited, whether that happens either via, um, via the data site metadata store or in a direct way. And I think that's, I think open air is, has got the potential of doing that. So just for completeness sake, the data site metadata schema, it's, it's a good schema. It's very general, it only has five mandatory properties and another 12 optional properties, but it has to be that level of generality because when you're dealing with everything from art history to zoology, you've got to be careful with that. You've got to have stuff that's as widely applicable as, pro as possible. For contrast, again, I'm not expecting you to um, be able to read any of this. This is moles. 
version 3.4. This is the metadata scheme that we use at the BADC. It's a bit complicated, right? But the important thing is here, the, that's all the metadata we collect for our systems. Only a very small subset of that metadata scheme is actually going to be needed for the data journal. So it's mapping between the two. And I suspect a lot of other repositories are in a similar situation. Right. So what we as prepared is going to do, we already have a link from the BADC through data site to GDJ. Uh, and GDJ can also pull the standard DOI metadata from the data site metadata store. We've already shown that works. What we need to do is fix that return link so that GDJ can inform BADC or NCAR or whatever repository it is that their data set has been cited and published. And we've got to be careful about how we do this because of the scaling issues that I mentioned earlier. We're going to be pragmatic. We might have to start with a manual workaround where we just fire off an email to a um, centralized email address at the repository. But we've got to keep an eye out on what we can do to kind of make it more scalable in the future. And if we can take advantage of what other work other people are doing, then that is definitely the way to go. So tell us what you think. So we're having a workshop on cross-linking between data centers and publishers, and that's planned for May in Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, which is um, quite close to Oxford in the UK. And uh, we've got a workshop on the peer review of data happening in March uh, at, the British, at the British Library. We love getting input from people. Come and talk to us, drop us a line, drop me an email, um, go and have a look at our project website and our blog. Talk to us. If you think there's something we should know, tell us about it. Part, a key part of the prepared project is stakeholder engagement. Um, so we want to produce something that will work. It might be a tall order, but that's what we want to do. So that's me. That's my email address. That's my Twitter handle. Um, and there's a picture of a cute kitten because the internet is made of cats after all. So thank you very much. Sarah, thank you.